you, Gabriel, for introducing me to the groups. It's uh, it's uh, always happy uh, to see participants in every batch doing foundation course. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for showing the interest in joining for such a training program. Um, and I hope you will be taking palliative care uh, in your day-to-day -day practice. So today we have uh, a session on symptoms. Uh, I'm not sure whether you, we, we, you might have covered pain, but this must be the first symptom apart from pain probably. So um, this is not a new topic. I mean, you, we all have learned symptoms, um, nausea, vomiting and everything. Uh, we all manage that on a day-to-day -day basis, but maybe we need to look, look at it with a different lens, uh, a lens of symptom management and you know, patients with palliative care needs. So today's uh, topic, topic will be focusing more on how to manage these kind of symptoms when patients with palliative care needs. So for that, we have Dr. Sangeeta. Dr. Sangeeta is uh, associated with Pallium India for the last two years, and she's a senior palliative care physician, and she's in charge of uh, pediatric palliative care at Pallium India. Uh, she has done her certificate course, a six weeks course, and currently she's pursuing her fellowship, which is again uh, focusing more on pediatric palliative care in collaboration with Elizabeth Kubler Road Foundation. And uh, she, is, she has her interest in community-based palliative care as well as uh, pediatric palliative care. Uh, she's been with us as faculty for quite some sessions uh, now. Thank you, Sangeeta, and over to you. Thank you, ma'am. So happy to be back again teaching uh, lots of students and uh, I hope this session will benefit a lot of people who is attending this and thereby uh, our patients also will benefit from that. So uh, let's start uh, today's session. Today I'll be focusing on nausea, vomiting and constipation. Uh, so our main objective for the day is to identify uh, the common GI problems which we come across in palliative care and uh, mainly focusing on nausea, vomiting, constipation and managing it from a palliative care perspective. So before we move on, it is better we have a patient idea or a, a, we go through a patient's history. Here we have a 55-year-old frail lady. She is suffering from a gastric carcinoma and she is on her chemotherapy. And she is admitted in a general ward for treatment of urinary tract infection. She was admitted with vomiting, abdominal colic and fever. Now she is tired and has, uh, and she's admitted for uh, completion of her IV antibiotics. She has small, frequent, incomplete bowel movements for the last four days and is started today on laxatives. She is accompanied by her younger daughter. So in this case, I want you to focus on what are the main issues here and how you would like to investigate and the way of management. Just keep this history as a brief idea and uh, we'll come back to this case later. So we'll move on. Now, what is emesis or what is vomiting? When we go with the definition, it is a biological defense mechanism of the body to remove the toxic or harmful substances from the body, especially after having it. And the process of emesis can be explained in three phases, that is nausea, retching, and vomiting. Nausea, it is an unpleasant sensation where the person feels the imminent need to vomit. And when we say retching, it is that spasmodic, uh, spasmodic respiratory movements, but the patient may not vomit. He'll have that tendency to vomit, the, the abdominal musculature, and the, uh, you know, the, he has that proper sensation to vomit. But there is no gastric content that is coming out. But in vomiting, what happens is the patient will have the uh, forceful expulsion of the gastric contents through the mouth associated with the contraction of the abdominal and chest wall muscles. Now, can uh, some of you tell me what are the types of vomiting that you are uh, aware of? Anyone? Watery, biliary, hematemesis. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, Dr. Parvati, she's seeing projectile. Yes. Projectile. Okay. 
the okay so, so there are different types of vomiting like projectile non projectile sometimes bilious non bilious or maybe uh, sometimes have you heard of any acute type of vomiting or delayed type of vomiting or something like refractory type of vomiting we'll see that so uh, i said you today we'll be focusing more on a palliative care perspective so depending upon that the patients who comes to us will be mostly on chemotherapy and so chemotherapy leads to some uh, vomiting and uh, based on that we can say there is acute type of vomiting which is occurring within few minutes to us and it resolves in 24 hours there is something called as delayed vomiting it usually occurs after 24 hours of receiving chemo and uh, it can go worse from uh, 48 to 72 hours following chemo and can last up to 6 to 7 days this is another type of vomiting called as delayed vomiting and there is something called as breakthrough vomiting it occurs despite the antiemetic treatment you are giving the treatment but still the patient is vomiting in between when he is on some medicines there is something called as refractory vomiting that means the vomiting is continuous continuously there it is not at all being able to manage with the current medications so that is known as refractory vomiting and there is something called as anticipatory vomiting it is a conditioned response prior to chemotherapy that means the patient is going to have chemotherapy tomorrow tomorrow suppose he is going to have chemotherapy tomorrow today itself the patient thinking of that the patient will start vomiting that is known as anticipatory vomiting so keep in mind there is acute delayed breakthrough vomiting refractory vomiting and anticipatory vomiting that you that you will be seeing in your patients now why are we concerned so much like why are we trying to treat these patients with nausea and vomiting we are concerned because it is affecting the patient's daily function it hinders the quality of life the patient is having there is non compliance to treatment that means the patient is on some chemotherapy uh, therapeutic drugs or maybe the patient is on having pain and he is taking morphin for that but due to this vomiting he is not able to take all this medicine he is continuously vomiting so there will be non compliance to the treatment there is inadequate symptom control or the fear or anxiety poor absorption of medicines can occur and moreover it will escalate the distress of patient as well as the family so that is why we are concerned with nausea and vomiting now what do you think are the causes for vomiting can anyone unmute and say chemotherapy itself is a cause yes ma'am what else even uh morphin drugs yes. can cause yes mm. and then there are few responses in the chat also uh, bowel obstruction serotonin yes ma'am so there are lot of causes which is leading to nausea and vomiting we'll see them in detail so uh, something that is uh, chemically induced nausea probably due to drugs like opioids one of you said morphine itself can cause nausea and vomiting if the patient is on some antibiotic treatment it can be a cause for nausea and vomiting cytotoxic agents the chemotherapeutic agents or something related to food the food poisoning or ischemic bowel gut obstruction metabolic organ failure all this can be a cause for metabolically induced nausea and vomiting and something gastric stasis anticholinergic drugs the opioids ascites peptic ulcer gastritis and gastritis even that can be due to some stress drugs or radiotherapy induced so all this can be a cause for nausea and vomiting stretch or distortion of, uh, distortion of the gi tract when there is constipation there is a stretch that is occurring in the intestinal tract this in turn can sometimes trigger the patient to have nausea and vomiting again ascites i'm, I'm, I'm sorry the intestinal obstruction the mesenteric myths all this can cause a stretch in the uh, gi leading to nausea and vomiting something even the liver myths it can lead to serosal irritation the ureteric obstruction can be a cause for nausea and vomiting irritation of the gi tract can also be due to some infections or the use of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs for example can lead to 
the irritation of GI tract and the patient can present to you with nausea and vomiting. Suppose the patient is having cerebral edema and which in turn leads to intracranial pressure. It rise in intracranial pressure can present to you with, the person can present to you with nausea and vomiting. Uh, the cerebral causes, other causes are intracranial bleeds, infections, space occupying lesions can lead to uh, this nausea and vomiting. Very commonly seen uh, when a person is going uphill or sometimes due to some movements, the, if the person is having vestibular disorders, can present with nausea and vomiting, which is very commonly seen in people with uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigos. So you need to rule out what is causing nausea and vomiting. And sometimes a patient may have anticipatory vomiting. I said you chemotherapy. The patient the day before itself may have this thought that tomorrow I'm going to get chemotherapy and start having some problems. This anxiety itself can lead to nausea and vomiting. And very importantly, quite often missed thing is the environmental factors. The patient, if certain foods can trigger him in having nausea and vomiting, the smell, the cleanliness, the distaste, with, these are the things which uh, we don't give more focus on. Actually, we should consider all those things also. Sometimes a patient is having some kind of fungal uh, ulcers or fungating ulcer from which there is foul smell. With this, the patient cannot have some you know, food. It can lead to nausea and vomiting. So when you're treating the patient, make sure you are seeing the person as a whole and identify the cause. What is leading to this nausea and vomiting? And then treat accordingly. So... Go through the uh, slides once again. You, you should be very clear with the causes. And these are some of the causes. There are other important factors which you should be always keeping in mind and that is uh, uh, oral thrush. Always make sure when a person is continuously vomiting, you look into his oral cavity. Look for any oral thrush. If it is there, manage it accordingly. Halitosis, mucositis, dysphagia, dyspepsia, hiccups. These are very commonly seen in patients who is presenting to you with uh, nausea and vomiting. Oral thrush, you need to manage it in the initial stages itself. Or whenever the patient is coming to you, if you see that's a severe form of candidiasis happening there, give, start him on antifungals. Uh, do the uh, oral, give him the proper oral care. Can anyone say me how do you manage oral thrush in your center? Maybe you can put it in the chat also if you want. Candid oral pain. Yes. Apart from that, do you want to give anything orally? I mean, uh, uh, systemically? Fluconazole. Yes. Yes. So we can, we can give uh, fluconazole for uh, maybe if IV access is there, you can start him on IV fluconazole if required. Or if he's able to take oral tablets at that point of time, maybe you can try oral thrush. And the person is continuously vomiting, it is it might be difficult. You can go ahead with IV uh, fluconazole preparation and make sure after each time the patient is vomiting, you give them a proper oral care. And how do we give oral care? Here, what we do is, in a glass of water, we put a pinch of soda bicarbonate powder and a pinch of uh, uh, salt. And with this, we ask the person to gargle and spit it out. So this helps in uh, cleaning the oral cavity. Sometimes using this mouthwashes can be a problem for them because it causes some uh, tingling sensation or burning sensation in their oral cavity. So we prefer uh, using the soda bicarbonate powder along with salt so that it helps them better. And also, as some of you mentioned, you can use the candid mouth paint uh, thrice or maybe sixth hourly, you can uh, apply the uh, candid mouth paint. This will also help them with, uh, help, the, help in treating their oral thrush. Okay. Now, uh, what are the common antiemetics that you know of? Very commonly used antiemetics in your centers or the ones that you prescribe more. Emicet. Okay. What else? Metoclopramide. 
Aloperidol, okay. Metronidazole, Dexamethasone, okay. Yeah, so there are a lot of antiemetics that we know of. But when a person is coming to us with vomiting, first thing that I said is identify the cause. And the next thing that comes to our mind is choosing the right antiemetic. Only then we can choose the right antiemetic. So first thing you identify the cause, identify the pathway which triggers the vomiting reflex, then identify the neurotransmitter receptor that is involved, choose a potent antagonist to the receptor identified and choose the route of administration. This is also very important. Why? Because if the person is continuously vomiting to give orally is difficult. So you need to take a IV route or a subcutaneous route. And after that, you need to titrate the dose, monitor the patient, and you need to administer it regularly. So choosing the anti-emetic anti is also equally important. Identify the cause, identify the pathway. Uh, you should know the receptors and choose the route of administration, titrate the dose, monitor the patient. Once you have started the anti-emetic, and it's not like, okay, you take for two days and stop. No, you can't do that. You need to monitor the patient, how he's responding to the, uh, responding to the anti-emetic that you have given and look whether you need to change the anti-emetic if it's not working or add some, one more anti-emetic together and then see if it's working. So proper monitoring of the patient is also equally important. Now, when we are choosing, uh, choosing an anti-emetic and we are starting to treat this patient for his controlling his vomiting. And our objective here is to reduce the frequency of vomiting and to establish the compliance of treatment to administer the oral medicines. I said to you when the person is continuously vomiting, he may not be able to take his chemotherapy drug or maybe the pain medicines. So in total, we are trying to improve his quality of life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now coming to the management. Uh, when we are managing this nausea and vomiting, uh, we should know what are the co uh, causes that can be corrected. Correct the cause. And uh, next thing is non-pharmacological measures, dietary modifications, and block the receptor at various sites. This is a principle that you need, that you need to know when you're treating, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, treating nausea and vomiting. Correct the cause. Go ahead with the non-pharmacological measures, dietary modifications, and block the receptor at various sites. When we come to non-pharmacological measures, avoid situations which uh, induces nausea and vomiting. I said to you, uh, if the patient is having a decubitus ulcer, or maybe a fungating wound, a foul-smelling environment, even that can lead to nausea and vomiting. So make sure non-pharmacological measures are also given equal importance and avoid such situations. Give a calm and reassuring environment. And there should be a lot of fresh air in his room where he is. And always nurse in the upright position. And along with that, when the per per person is vomiting, I said you, a good oral hygiene is equally important. Okay. And control of malodor. If a person is on some colostomy bag, advise them the proper techniques, how to take care of the colostomy. If he's having a fungating tumor, do daily dressings and treat or try to reduce the uh, malodor from that. If there is an ulcer, give the proper dressing so that he is able to have a good environment uh, where he is. And use suitable distractors. Distractors are very important, especially you might have seen in some uh, chemotherapy wards and all, when the patient is getting chemo, they'll be given newspapers or maybe some, uh, they'll have some television and they'll be seeing some cinemas or something like that. Distractors are very important. And there are different techniques like self-hypnosis, progressive muscle relaxation, biofeedback, systematic desensitization. These are all techniques which is mostly used by psychologists uh, in helping us uh, treating nausea and vomiting. So it is more useful in anticipatory vomiting and can be used alone or together with anti-emetic drugs. Uh, why we are using, is, uh, using this is because it enhances a feeling of control and reduces the feeling of helplessness. And uh, most importantly, when the patient is continuously vomiting, the family members are equally 
distressed they'll come and ask you what will i give them they're continuously vomiting do something so what can we advise so we can say them uh, to give them small frequent fee feeds consume mostly during the day time and avoid fatty uh, sweet or spicy foods or carbonated drinks okay this small frequent uh, feeds are very important the pay, uh, the caregiver uh, might come to you and say see he is not eating like before do something uh, but the patient maybe a sip of water or a sip a spoon of oats that is enough for him when you force try to force feed him he'll start vomiting more so you need to properly convey this thing to the caregiver also and eat foods that are easy to digest on stomach okay something like oats or uh, the rice well cooked rice you can give that or some uh, soups you can try feeding them so dietary modification is also equally important now what else can you do always keep the uh, mouth clean and do good oral care after each episode of vomiting wear a uh, loose fitting clothes have fresh air like fan or use a fan or a open window limit the sound the sight and the smell that causes nausea and vomiting give the contact information if uh, nausea or vomiting is not controlled why because if the patient we advise we have given him anti emetics we have uh, given them the non pharmacological measures dietary modifications everything you have said the patient and caregiver see all those things you can do at last till uh, the patient may might have some kind of distress and you give a contact information of your hospital or your number what happens is okay if this thing is not working i can go to the hospital and speak to this or speak to this person so that something can be done that hope itself will give them that reassurance and this nausea it will help in uh, reducing the nausea and vomiting tendency now coming to the pharmacological measures so uh, when we say about pharmacological measures there are five key players Uh, that you need to know which is triggering this uh, nausea and vomiting that is area prostrema or the ctz zone chemotherapy uh, trigger zone the git plays a vital role the vestibular nucleus plays a vital role the cerebral cortex plays a vital role in uh, triggering this vomiting center and thereby leading to nausea and vomiting so in order to uh, get a better understanding we'll see a small video so that you'll know it you'll understand it better so uh how was the video i hope you had some idea like what is really happening now if i talk to you regarding the medicines and the receptors i think it will be more easy to understand so uh so what are the five key players can anyone unmute and say sorry about that yeah can anyone unmute and say what are the five key players okay so we have the uh, uh, gi the area prostrema or ctz the cerebral cortex and the vestibular nuclei which is playing the key role in triggering the vomiting center so when these things get triggered and it in turn triggers the vomiting center and from there the patient gets the tendency to vomit so there is different receptors like the serotonin receptors dopamine receptors all those things are the ones who is facilitating this so when we give a anti emetic we need to block this only then the patient will stop vomiting so depending upon that we have anticholinergics uh, neuroleptics prokinetic drugs h1 antihistamine uh, histamines 5st3 uh, antagonist and adjuvant anti emetics so these are common drugs which you will be most commonly using uh hyoscine is very commonly used it is also uh, anti secretory anti cholinergic so we, we it can help in decreasing the uh, secretions uh then uh, most commonly used is metoclopramide uh, it is a prokinetic agent so uh 
yeah it's it's also very commonly used and some of you said me emiset or uh, uh, the you know uh, on dan setron is the common thing which you are using in your center so what it does is it blocks the 5st3 receptor and thereby it is causing the uh, it is helping in stopping this nausea and vomiting and there is something like adjuvant antiemetics uh, like dexamethasone what is dexamethasone it is a corticosteroid it is a long acting corticosteroid it helps in decreasing the uh, peri tumor edema thereby the stretch i said you the one among the causes was the stretch in gi tract it helps in decreasing the edema and thereby it helps in decreasing nausea and vomiting and there uh, you can also use benzodiazepines and uh, so many other drugs which helps in nausea and vomiting i think you can go through the uh, slides in knowing better uh, yeah so we'll go ahead uh, there are uh, there is something called as refractory vomiting i, I said you, you you have given all your antiemetic drugs and after that uh, uh, still the patient is continuously vomiting so what you are trying to do is you are trying to uh, give them some anti uh, psychotics which will act on their brain and help in decreasing the uh, nausea and vomiting and most commonly uh, uh, we use haloperidol haloperidol it can be given in a dose of 0.5 to 2 mg intravenously every 8 hourly and it will help in decreasing uh, nausea and vomiting other drugs most commonly used is olanzapine and levopromethacin and corticosteroids as i said you uh, once you start giving the person uh, iv uh, dexamethasone uh, usually it is given as a single uh, shot in the morning uh, why because it has a uh, longer duration of action and also if you are giving it on the later half of the day it hinders with their sleep so uh, corticosteroids are a very good option if you suspect there is some liver mets or the tumor size is the cause or the stretch in the gi somewhere the tumor is increasing in size that is leading to uh, nausea and vomiting maybe you can add this along with your antiemetic this can be given as adjuvant antiemetics and there are other options like opriotides uh, but uh, it is on a expensive side so we prefer uh, if this thing is not working only then we can think about the other uh, options like opriotides then hyoscine benzodiazepine can cannabinoids are other options which you can try and next a very important thing is the root of antiemetic and uh, i said you the patient, person is continuously vomiting so it is not easy or uh, if you give the uh, antiemetic as oral tablets on the initial phase it is not going to work so as for the patient's condition and preference the route also changes oral route is a usually the best and easiest way but if the patient is continuously vomiting we may need to switch to iv or subcutaneous route or even we may have to give it as continuous subcutaneous infusions suppositories are also available sublingual preparations like a thin film enricot i mean a thin, thin film patches uh, i mean it's like a small film uh, with different flavors it is available maybe you can uh, give if that is uh, uh, that is available in your center transdermal patches are also available so mainly yeah. there is a uh, oral route can be tried iv or subcutaneous routes can be tried or even continuous subcutaneous infusion may be required subcutaneous uh, suppositories are available sublingual preparations are available transdermal patches are available now uh, when we come to the management of nausea and vomiting uh, there are certain uh, guidelines Uh, that you need to know uh, document the most likely cause what is the cause that you are thinking and up only after identifying the cause you start your antiemetic treat the potential reversible causes and exacerbating factors like drugs constipation severe pain infection cough all those things should be uh, taken care of if it is reversible uh, i mean uh, try to treat it first and then the nausea and vomiting will uh, subside and uh, there is something uh, yeah once you start an antiemetic always i said you you need to monitor the patient review the dose after 24 hours and uh, review the cause also after 24 to 48 hours once you have started an antiemetic and after some time i mean uh, the next day if you are going and seeing still the patient is vomiting maybe you can wait for one more day if it's not working if you feel it's a uh, vomiting is increasing in uh, frequency maybe you need to add some other drug and if you think the cause is different maybe you need to change the present anti antiemetic and then uh, switch on to 
something another. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, remember that one by third of the patient will need more than one antiemetic. And if parenteral, uh, and if he is on parenteral uh, antiemetic, consider converting it to an oral uh, antiemetic only after 72 hours or after getting a good control only, you, you can switch the person from uh, this IV preparation to oral preparation. Uh, now coming to the pharmacological management, these are the most commonly used medicine I said you. There is haloperidol, uh, around uh, 1.5 to 20 milligrams per day. You can give it as uh, orally or subcutaneously. Metoclopramide is a prokinetic agent. Uh, 10 to uh, 30 milligrams every 2 to 4 hourly. You can give it as per oral subcutaneous uh, IV uh, preparation. And domperidone, ondansetron, diphenhydramine, octreotide. Uh, I know in some centers it is available around 50 to 100 uh, micrograms. You can give it as 4 to 8 hourly as IV and subcutaneous preparation. Dexamethasone, uh, around 4 to 8 milligrams, 8 hourly, uh, can be given uh, per orally, IV or subcutaneously. Okay. Uh, so, till now, uh, if anyone has any doubts, you can ask regarding nausea and vomiting. Okay, since time is a con uh, factor, we need to move on. Uh, so our next topic for uh, the session is uh, constipation. Yeah, so most commonly constipation is a problem uh, which patients come to you with. And today we'll see what is constipation, why it is important to treat constipation and what are the causes uh, for constipation and how do we assess it? Now, uh, what is constipation? It is the difficult or painful defecation and is associated with infrequent bowel evacuation and hard feces. It is a subjective feeling. Always ask the patient how different it is from their normal pattern. Why? Because for some people, Passing stools every third day is normal. That, that might be their usual pattern. But for uh, another person, it can be every day they pass maybe one or two times per day. That is their normal. So always make sure you ask them how different it is from their normal pattern. More than 45% of person uh, coming, uh, especially the palliative patient coming to you will be constipated during the time you see them or during the period of admission. Now, the common symptoms which they say is, they'll tell you that there is feeling of incomplete evacuation. There can be a blotted feeling. Sometimes the patient may, might present you with nausea and vomiting. And we have discussed this in the causes also. So the GI tract stretching due to constipation can lead to nausea and vomiting. Or sometimes the patient can present with abdominal cramps or pain. Or even uh, bowel obstruction can occur. And there is something called as overflow diarrhea or the patient can also present with urinary retention. Uh, does anyone know what is overflow diarrhea? Have you heard of it? Spurious diarrhea, no? Yeah, spurious diarrhea. It's after the constipation for a long time, uh, there is uh, some amount of diarrhea which comes in spite of the constipation. That's yes. what is spurious diarrhea. Yes, yes. So we'll look into that on detail. And uh, why urinary retention? Any idea why? Constipation can cause urinary retention. Yes, ma'am. How? Very commonly when we go for home care, the person, uh, we'll, we might get the call saying that the patient's urinary catheter is blocked. And when we go and see, the catheter might have been changed maybe in the last few days. And now his re recurrent uh, urinary block is being happening. So when we do a parietal examination, we come to know that the patient is having, uh, patient is severely constipated or maybe there is heart feces in the 
rectal area. When we do a manual evacuation and give a enema, after that, once his bowel pattern is normal, the urine, the block in the catheter uh, is resolved. I mean, the urine starts flowing clearly. So what happens is the heart faces compresses the uh, bladder and then that is leading to the urinary block and leading to urinary retention. And overflow diarrhea or serious diarrhea, what happens is the uh, fecal matter is, I mean, uh, there will be a period of constipation followed by the person presence with a small amount of, uh, you know, uh, this motion coming all the time. The, the caregiver, even sometimes there is constipation for maybe more than 20 or even months. Then they may not complain anything like that. They are, they are only concerned with this urinary block. So we need to uh, address this thing. The, that constipation is the thing which is leading to this urinary block and we need to take care of his bubble pattern. Only then this thing can be controlled. Okay, so uh, spurious diarrhea is also very common. There will be a period of constipation following which the patient presents with diarrhea. And how do we manage? We need to uh, reverse his or treat the constipation and then only uh, this thing can be taken care of. We'll see that in detail. Okay, now coming to the causes of constipation. Uh, more very commonly seen is, especially in a palliative care setting, when the person is on morphine or any opioids, very commonly there is constipation. And more than 90% of people with opioids will have constipation. And if the patient is on some uh, antidepressants, anticholinergics, antiemetics, antacids, somatostatin analogs, all these things can cause constipation. Uh, there are metabolic factors like dehydration, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, uremia, causing constipation. Diet, when the patient is having a poor appetite or low fluid intake or fiber intake, can lead to constipation. Environmental factors, here again, hospitalization, inability to attend the call. When the patient is admitted in a hospital, uh, he is in a ward. Everybody is using a common toilet. It is difficult for the person to go there and use the toilet. So all these environmental factors should also be considered. Inability to attend the call. What if the person is bed bound? Is a stroke patient? He is bed bound. Nobody is at home. Or sometimes uh, there is only a very uh, small girl who is taking care of this patient. So at that time, what happens is the person will be waiting for somebody else to come back from the job and take care, take the person to the toilet and then use the toilet. By that time, the patient might not be able to pass motion. So these are environmental factors when you need to keep in mind. So uh, next is neurological factors, like something like malignant spinal cord compression or sacral nerve infiltration leading to constipation. There are structural factors, that is the pelvic tumors or radiotherapy-induced fibrosis, painful anorectal conditions, intraluminal obstruction leading to constipation. Then other factors like depression, weakness, immobility, inactivity, sedation, age, all these things can lead to constipation. And why are we worried with uh, uh, constipation? Because in advanced conditions, it can lead to uh, uh, colicky abdominal pain. The patient can present with severe abdominal pain. There can be anorexia. The patient will be continuously vomiting. And I said to you, there can be urinary retention. The patient can present with anxiety, sometimes confusion and delirium in elderly. This is also very common, especially if the patient is uh, elderly. The you, you may get uh, phone calls from the caregiver saying that he is continuously shouting, doctor, please come and do something. So uh, we very quite often missed, we, we may not ask how is his bowel pattern. We need to ask regarding the bowel pattern because constipation can trigger delirium in elderly patient. Not only in elderly, sometimes even when the patient is admitted in ICU, uh, sometimes the patient can have this kind of delirium because of constipation uh, or some that confused state because of constipation. Okay, so make sure he is passing his tools in his uh, regular pattern. And if there is any change or uh, some problem is there, he's not able to pass, manage it accordingly. Now, morphine 
I said you it can cause constipation. How it causes constipation is by decreasing the propulsive intestinal activity. And so what happens? There will be additional time available for the water reabsorption. So uh, there is, when the water reabsorption occurs, the fecal matter gets hardened. So there is inhibition of secretomotor neurons and less fluid will enter the gut. And then it reduces the sensation of rectal distension and it, it in turn leads to fecal impaction. Okay, so morphine, it decreases the propulsive intestinal activity and there is additional time that is available for the water reabsorption. When the inhib it also causes inhibition of secretomotor neurons and leading to less, uh, so that it, it leads to less fluid will be entering the gut. It reduces the sensation of rectal distension and leading to fecal impaction. Now coming to the assessment, how will you assessment? Do the assessment, always ask the patient what is the normal pattern, how he is passing the stool. Ask the frequency, amount, consistency, is it blood stained or not? Uh, when was the last bowel movement? Is the patient experiencing any abdominal discomfort, cramping, nausea and vomiting? Is there any excessive gas or rectal fullness? Uh, ask the patient if he's having if he's using a regular laxative and what medications are the patients on. Very important, see if he's on any opioids or sometimes any anti-emetics or anything like that or any anti, uh, I mean, any, uh, antidepressants or any psychiatric medications which can be a cause for constipation. So look for what are the medicines he's on and is the constipation a recent change and also make sure you ask him how his diet is. Now, uh, very commonly seen uh, thing is when we ask for his bowel pattern, the caregiver might say since 20 days, he's not passing any stool, uh, but he's only taking fluids or maybe soft diet. That's why he's not passing stools. He hasn't eaten enough. Uh, then how will he or she pass motion? Or sometimes a patient with overflow diarrhea will say, see, he's going on passing diarrhea. Then you are saying he's constipated. Very commonly, we come across these kind of situations. So what happens is, uh, in the large bowel, the transit time is uh, around three to four days for normal people. The stool contains shedded epithelium and major bulk uh, is the byproduct of the bacterial action. So even if the patient is not taking any food or uh, anything for a few days, there is a metabolic activity that is happening and some amount of stool should go out. So that's the explanation we need to give to them. Even if the patient is not taking any food or is, is only on soft diet, there is some amount of motion or the large bowel epithelium is shedding and some amount of motion will be formed and that should be taken care of. So uh, this is called a Bristol stool chart. You can uh, uh, ask, uh, show this to your patient and ask how uh, his, uh, you know, stool pattern is and ask, uh, it will help in understanding uh, if he's constipated or not. Okay, now coming to the management, uh, here again, always correct the correctable. You should use laxatives. Uh, judicious use of laxatives should be there and improve the general condition, symptom control, uh, encourage activity uh, and the diet it should be uh, taken care of. We can't say that you should increase fiber in your diet. Sometimes when you increase the fiber in diet, uh, the patient might need to drink lots of water. Sometimes that's not possible. Whatever diet the patient is able to take, ask them to take that. That is enough. Okay, so correct the correctable, judicious use of laxatives and improve the general condition. Symptom control, encourage activity. Now coming to the man non-pharmacological management, daily assessment is very important. Uh, whenever you go for rounds, ask the patient that have you passed stools today uh, or uh, how is his bowel pattern? He, he, if he's a person who is passing stools daily, ask him if he's gone. If uh, maybe some, sometimes it can be once in two days, that's his usual pattern. Okay, maybe we can wait for one more day before doing any intervention. So daily assessment should be done improve mobility if that's possible, 
and access to toilet facility that is also very important if he's have having that tendency to go and the toilet is far away sometimes he may uh, think okay once he gets discharged and go home only then he'll pass through no that is not, that should not be the case if the toilet facility try to uh, you know use a commode chair if that's possible or any uh, uh, settings or a bed pan or something like that if he wants to pass uh, the stool it make arrangements for whatever is possible in the best way and uh, prompt response to patients call if it is a, if he is at home and uh, there is nobody to take care of the person uh, make sure you get somebody to help the patient in shifting at that particular time or something like that and uh, there should be uh, somebody to help the patient only then you can manage this otherwise if you don't take care of his cons i mean his bowel pattern it can lead to constipation and complications related to that so uh, that thing should be kept in mind privacy privacy is also very important especially if he is in a ward and even you gave him a commode chair most of the most of the time they may not pass uh, you know uh, motion in a commode chair in a hospital setting sometimes if it is in their home sometimes they can use even the bed pan also if you give it in a hospital setting it is very difficult for some people to pass motion so uh, make sure there is adequate privacy if that is a situation you give proper privacy and ask them to uh, use this thing okay diet and fluid intake is also another important thing which you should uh, keep in mind uh, like whenever he is able to take uh, fluids uh, ask him to take it sometimes uh, in uh, you know very deteriorating condition fluid intake is again a uh, difficult situation ask for the situation and uh, uh, you know the caregiver and uh, 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 surroundings maybe you need to take a decision on the diet and fluid intake and attention to other symptoms like i said you sometimes a patient can present with delirium you make sure you see if the, the per person is not constipated okay now uh, rectal examination uh, uh, rectal examination is something uh, which you should be uh, doing if the patient is complaining of constipation or sometimes you feel even if they don't complain of constipation you feel that it may be due to constipation he is presenting to you with the so and so symptoms make sure you do the rectal examination and when you do the rectal examination also privacy is another important thing which you should keep in mind and uh, uh, yeah once you get the consent and you start doing it and if the rectum in the rectal examination you find to have that the rectum is empty and collapsed it indicates that it is a normal functioning bowel and when you do the rectal examination if it is uh, empty and dilated it indicates the feces is higher up in the bowel and sometimes uh, you may not get anything it is very dilated there is enough space for your fingers to move around uh, th that is suggestive of constipation or sometimes a chronic constipation uh, i'm sorry uh, a suggestive of uh, constipation it feels ballooned that means there is more space a uh, lot of space in the uh, this thing and there is no fecal matter at all in the fingertips you don't get anything indicates uh, it indicates gross constipation uh, a long period of constipation is there that is the finding you get in uh, if you feel the uh, rectum is ballooned balloony rectum that's what we say when you do a pr we get a balloony rectum it indicates a gross constipation and if the feces even you do a pr examination you get the feces in your fingertips that means uh, you need to determine the consistency consistency and manage accordingly that means you can either keep a suppository or do a manual evacuation keep a suppository or if you want to feel like uh, giving a enema maybe you can do accordingly as per the situation and sometimes when you do a per rectal examination you may get tumor i mean you, you may be touching the tumor it can feel as irregular hard immobile uh, structure that you are feeling sometimes if it is not if you are not able to manage that in your center maybe you need to refer the patient so a uh, very important thing instead of waiting for all these complications to occur we know sometimes you are the person who is starting morphin the then definitely the patient is going to have constipation or something you are see you are you should try to foresee certain things you know like the patient is having some gi tumor the probable i mean there is chance that he can go for constipation on the initial days itself you should try to you know say them that or maybe give importance or check on his bowel pattern how he is 
uh, doing and all that. And especially if the patient is on morphine, you make sure you are charting a laxative along with that. In your pain classes also, when you start morphine, there is an anti-emetic as well as a laxative along with morphine. Only then your prescription is complete. Okay. And now coming to the uh, classification of laxatives, we have bulk forming laxatives, fecal softeners, osmotic agents, stimulant laxatives and others. Uh, in bulk forming, uh, ismaul husk very commonly used, but in a palliative care setting, we don't prefer using it much. We'll come to that. Uh, and fecal softeners like liquid paraffin or decosate sodium. Uh, osmotic, we have lactulose, very commonly used. Uh, and we have uh, magnesium salts or magnesium hydroxide suspensions. Uh, osmotic uh, laxatives are very common and available in syrup forms and all. Mm, then something very commonly used is the stimulant laxatives like bisacodyl uh, or senna, very commonly used. And uh, prokinetic agents like metoclopramide, uh, and erythromycin. Prokinetic, I said you, it helps in the uh, forward movement of the uh, uh, intestine and thereby it helps in pushing out the uh, fecal matters. Okay, so uh, most commonly what we use these uh, the sti uh, stimulant laxatives like bisacodyl and uh, osmotic agents like crimaffin or the magnesium uh, salts, that's what we commonly use. Now the bulk forming, uh, what it does is it increases the fecal mass, thereby stimulates peristalsis. So the stool formed is bulkier and softer. But the problem when we use it is, it is unsuitable for elderly and debilitated patients as they need to drink extra fluids and it is not normally used in palliative care patients. Uh, osmotic lax laxatives, I said you, lactulose, very commonly used. Uh, it is a non-absorbable sugar, exerts an osmotic influence causing water retention in the lumen. And uh, what it does is it can, why we should be careful when using uh, lactulose because it can cause dehydration and sometimes cramps and the patient can feel nauseated. Uh, fecal softeners like liquid paraffin, not used alone as a laxative. It is usually combined with a stimulant laxative. Uh, stimulant laxative, very commonly used is visacodyl. It has a direct action on the uh, myentric plexus and submucosal plexus. It has both motor and secretory action and should be avoided in uh, complete obstruction. So usually the uh, prescription will look like this. When the patient is initially started on some opioids or complaints of constipation, we, we give them 10 milligrams of bisacodyl, which is a stimulant laxative, along with a stool softener. Okay. And if still it is not being controlled, maybe we need to give it as BD dose, 10 milligrams BD dose, along with a stool softener. Stool softener also, maybe you can increase it as BD dose. And uh, yeah, if BD dose is not working, you may have to give it as thrice a day dose. And with that also, if he's not having any relief, maybe you need to do a correct examination and do some manual uh, removal if that's possible. If not, you can uh, give some suppository or low or high enema. What is uh, low enema and high enema? Lower enema is very commonly seen to uh, uh, give the enema directly. That is using, uh, the, 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 there is a tube in the enema set, no? You give it directly, that is the commonly seen one. High up enema is something different. Here, what you do is you put a suction catheter and then you uh, insert the catheter correctly and then you push the enema through the catheter. So here, what happens is, So here what happens is you're inserting the suction catheter. So it will bypass all those things and come up. Huh? So then you're pushing the enema. Then what happens? It will flush out the whole thing. Understood. 
So in higher minima, when you uh, insert the catheter, and then that's how we manage uh, this uh, spur spurious diarrhea or overflow diarrhea. In overflow diarrhea, what happens? This thing will be blocking it. And some amount of freshly formed feces will come here and it will be going through the sites and coming out. And that the patient or the family says that, that he's having continuous diarrhea. No, it is actually the newly formed feces which comes up here and then uh, only a little bit of that is being liquefied and passing out. So when we put uh, the management of spurious diarrhea is you insert a suction catheter, insert it, and then you give the uh, enema and then it will act locally and then help in pushing out the uh, fecal matter. So spurious or overflow diarrhea, it is a sudden onset of diarrhea after a period of constipation. Uh, it is suggestive of chronic constipation and fecal impaction. Here what we do is we do a rectal examination and digital evacuation is a treatment followed by regularizing the laxatives. So uh, constipation is a symptom, it is not a disease. No laxatives will work if you do not give enough or if you do not give it at all. So always keep in mind this and uh, we'll generally need a stool softener and stimulant laxative. So we'll come back to the case again. Uh, so initially we started with this. Here we have a 55 year old lady. She's having gastric carcinoma and she's on chemotherapy. Now she's admitted following urinary tract infection and she's on her antibiotics. And uh, now she's having vomiting, abdominal colic, and fever. And uh, she's also complaining of free, uh, small, frequent, incomplete bowel movements for four days. And she started today on laxatives. She's accompanied by a younger daughter. Now you have to tell me what are the issues that you're seeing here. Please unmute. If you would like to unmute and talk, or you can type uh, your points. All the issues are highlighted. You can just read it out. Yeah, Tanu was uh, responding UTI fever. Constipation is there. She's constipated because of carcinoma. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chemotherapy. Okay. There is vomiting. Yeah, antibiotics itself can cause vomiting, yes. She's not tolerating orally. Yeah. Now, uh, how would you like to investigate this person? May progress to... Uh, subacute intestinal obstruction. Yes, that's true. And now she's admitted in your hospital and now you're going to manage her. Do you think any investigation is required here? Yeah, per rectal examination can be done. Uh, Commonly in, uh, yeah, commonly in patients following a stroke or neurologic illness, it is seen in patients on formula feeds, either NG root, bike peg. What is the recommended solution for improving bowel movements in these group of patients? So can you uh, 
give a little more clarification on that, Chita Ananda, sir. Maybe you can unmute and ask that question. Commonly, when a patient has a stroke and is bedridden because of the neurological, so they have because of the swallowing issues, they are either on peg feeds or nasogastric tube. Okay. okay. So for easy administration, they are on uh, uh, formula feeds, the readily available formula, your NQ or whatever. There's various formula feeds which are available, which are uh, hardly have any fiber, uh, fiber content in them. Nutritionally, they may be providing the adequate calories or other uh, necessary components like the pro protein, sugars, and the uh, fat and all that. But uh, you frequently we see these patients, they develop constipation, or they don't move their bowels regularly. Or yes. when you add their the laxity, they go into uh, diarrhea and uh, uncontrolled diarrhea in these patients because they're bedridden can lead to pressure source. It becomes a vicious circle. So what is the recommended, uh, this thing like, uh, so that they have a regular bowel opening, which, uh, which can be easy, easily managed. That's what I mean. Yes, sir. Okay. Here again, uh, as you said, when we give laxatives, there will be an initial purge of, you know, this motion is being passed and that problems will be there. So what we can do is we need to add a laxative. No matter what, we need to add a laxative. The initial thing can be taken care of. And once the bowel pattern is regularized, maybe a small amount is only sufficient. Or maybe uh, once in two days, you can give the laxative and then the, let the motion pass. And along with that, you need to take care of the general condition and the skin care. If there is a pressure sore, make sure you're doing a proper care for that. And uh, make it a habit that to fall, uh, you know, like, at a particular time so that the patient will fall into that track where he will be passing stool at a particular time so that the caregiver will be uh, more aware. And you said about the formula feeds. The formula feeds are not only really the thing you can be giving the patient. You can start giving them the homemade food also. It's not necessary that the patient has to go and buy this thing. One thing is it is expensive. Other thing is homemade food is more, you know, effective also like the uh, rice and the, you know, the green grams and all, you make it, cook it well and make it into a, you know, puree or something like that so that it is easily passing through the rice stew so that you can give the nutritious food also. Even the soups and all those things, once you make it, you can grind it very well and let it, you can ask the caregiver to feed that. Even that is enough. Uh, and also, uh, along with that, uh, you give laxatives. There will be that initial purge of this thing happening. Uh, but once that is settled, you can stop it and give uh, laxatives like once in three days or two days, if it is for a CV or some other causes. But if the patient is on some morphine or some other uh, intestinal obstruction or something that you're suspecting, maybe you need to give it on as a regular dose to prevent all those. Uh, Sri Devi, ma'am, you want to add anything on that? Thank you. No, Sangeeta, no. no. Please go ahead. You have covered. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we now know what are the issues this uh, uh, lady is being facing. Now we know how we, we can see the investigations. Definitely, you can go ahead with the serum electrolytes. And if there is chronic constipation, if you want, if your center, there is uh, some x-ray facility available, you can go and uh, take an x-ray. But most of the cases, you will be seeing the person in a home care setting. And uh, X-ray and all those things may not be even possible in rural parts of India and all. It is very difficult. So manage accordingly. Investigations only if the patient is severely tired or some uh, delirium has set in. Uh, we just want to know if, whether it is due to constipation the person is presenting with delirium or is it because of some electrolyte imbalance the person is presenting with delirium. So, so that investigation can be done. And how would you manage? We have covered almost everything. You know, like we have uh, said about the non-pharmacological measures, the pharmacological measures, and to prevent what all can be taken care of. And in this case, a particular thing that I don't know if you have noticed that she is being accompanied by a younger daughter to a hospital. So what does that indicate? So she is, she doesn't have a good caregiver support, or we don't know what is happening in the family, but still when a person is coming to a, what if you are going to a hospital and you are accompanied by somebody, you know, uh, 
a person who is able to give uh, proper attention and all those things you will be taking your parents or your elders in the family but she is being accompanied by her younger daughter so what if when she goes back home also there is no proper caregiver and maybe she, there is some environmental factors which we discussed there is no proper uh, caregiver and so she is not able to maybe attend her calls that might have led her for this constipation and the constipation has in turn led to urinary tract infection so this is like a cycle so when you see the patient when you uh, are trying to treat a patient try to see the patient as a whole why this patient has developed constipation that is also something you need to take care of and if you feel there is no caregiver support or somebody like that try to get in touch with your social officer or somebody uh, a neighbor or a volunteer somebody if you have that support maybe try to help her in some or the other way so that she doesn't go into this uh, you know the symptoms of all those things i think we have a case presentation also we will move on to that Uh, yeah, it will take the case presentation and continue the discussion after that. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Asmar. I am working as a junior palliative physician at that. I joined recently, and this was uh, one of the very first cases I saw once I joined, uh, which showed the eye symptoms. This is the case of a 65-year-old. A male patient who was diagnosed with a mucinous carcinoma of the unseen prostate pancreas encasing the superior mesenteric artery with uh, malignant biliary obstruction. He was diagnosed in uh, 2021 December. Uh, he came to us with uh, complaints of multiple episodes of vomiting for the past two days uh, uh, associated with constipation, abdominal distension, and occasional hiccups. So uh, the patient uh, initially he had uh, intermittent dull aching pain abdominal pain. Uh, this was in uh, 2021, uh, and uh, it was associated with nausea and vomiting. Uh, he didn't take the symptoms too seriously, and after being symptomatic for around uh, six months' time, he consulted the hospital, and there they did the investigations and uh, further workup, and uh, on imaging, it showed a involved cystic lesion, following which uh, uh, a laparotomy was done and true cut biopsy was taken, and it showed the unsmeared process showed a hard lesion which was encasing the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, and they gave a diagnosis of serous cystadenoma of the pancreas with no evidence of liver meds. Uh, following this, uh, he underwent 17 rounds of chemotherapy. Uh, and then uh, following chemo, a further CT showed uh, a malignant biliary obstruction. This was done in May 2023. Uh, when he came, uh, he was conscious and oriented and he appeared emaciated. Uh, pulse was uh, 50 per minute, BP was 100 over 70, he was ephebrile, uh, her abdomen uh, was soft, bowel sounds was sluggish, and tender, tenderness was present over the right hypochondrium and epigastrium. Uh, his chest was clear with uh, air entry bilateral equal, uh, S1 and S2 are heard, uh, and CNS had uh, no focal neurological deficit and higher mental functions were normal. Uh, as far as past treatment history, uh, initially, a USG abdomen was done, which showed just a grade one fatty liver and a right renal cyst. And then, uh, after his symptoms began, a CT abdomen showed a thin wall cystic lesion of the body of pancreas closely abutting the myeloproliferative neoplasm. Uh, and on an endoscopic ultrasound plus biopsy was done, which showed the serous cystadenoma of pancreas uh, with the query malignant or inflammatory mass of antony process noted. Following this, a diagnostic lab was converted to laparotomy with true cut biopsy from the unseen process, which showed a heart lesion involving the unseen process, encasing the superior mesenteric artery with no evidence of liver meds. Uh, Follow up CT abdomen showed a gallbladder obstruction with percutaneous stent placement done. Uh, 17 rounds of chemotherapy was done, and uh, he was on tab ultraset uh, BDR SOS and tab MSET SOS. Uh, as far as psychosocial aspects, uh, he is buried. He has one son. Uh, he was running a ration shop until uh, his illness came. Uh, his wife is a retired bank employee. Uh, he has good support from his wife and son. Uh, their current financial situation is uh, they are being supported by his wife's pension. Uh, he has no history of any addictions. Uh, both the patient and wife are aware of the diagnosis and the prognosis, but the son was not accepting. As for the medications, we started him on. Uh, he was started initially on uh, Dexona 16 milligram IV. Uh, for four days and was then tapered. Uh, 
Rantac 50 mg IV PD, Pernom 10 mg IV thrice daily, Ultraset uh, thrice daily, Cremafen uh, syrup 15 ml at night, Tap Fluconazole, we had oral crush, 150 mg OD into 5 days, and uh, Candid mouth pain for local application and syrup xylopene viscous 5 ml plus gelosyl 5 ml TDS. This was because after vomiting, he had some discomfort in his throat. Okay. Uh, the main concern was uh, the patient had become fearful about his diagnosis and he was constantly worried about dying. Uh, the patient's son was also not accepting of the bad prognosis of the illness. Uh, the patient who earlier used to be quite sociable with his uh, friends and family, he had become reclusive once he had heard about the diagnosis and he became sicker following his uh, therapy. Uh, the patient was always speaking about death and he also lost interest in his spirituality. So, summary, it's a 65-year-old uh, male patient who was diagnosed with CA pancreas and who came with complaints of vomiting, abdominal distension, and constipation. Uh, he underwent diagnostic laparotomy with glucose biopsy followed by 17 rounds of chemo and was now referred for palliative treatment because of poor response to therapy. Uh, patient was currently reclusive from family and friends due to his illness and patient was in distress due to recurrent episodes of vomiting. Uh, so, the discussion points are uh, what was done for the symptomatic relief for his recurrent vomiting, uh, what we did for his pain, uh, the nutritional support that was given to him, and uh, unfortunately, the patient expired and uh, the support was given for the bereaved family after the patient's passing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ajmal, for that uh, uh, case. So, uh, so he presented with uh, continuous vomiting, and uh, the in management what they have done is uh, they have started him on. Can you yeah, this is yeah, this is how uh, uh, we have treated him. We have given uh, dexamethasone, and uh, we have uh, also added an antiemetic metoclopramide. So uh, dexamethasone, uh, you can see it, it was given uh, as sixteen milligrams intravenously uh, once in a day was given. Uh, it was because uh, the patient had uh, vomiting. It was an adjuvant antiemetic. And also probably we had a suspicion of uh, intestinal obstruction. So it will help with both. So that's why dexamethasone was given. And uh, Rantac, here again, it is an anticholinergic. And uh, it will help in bringing down the secretions. And it will help in uh, with this uh, vomiting as well. So it was given and for his pain, it was managed with ultraset and with that itself, he had good pain relief. And uh, another thing is he had oral thrush and so it was managed with the uh, uh, He was able to have it and oral care was given and uh, the candid mouth pain, the clotomasol mouth pain was used to treat the candidiasis along with the oral care. Due to this continuous vomiting, the patient had uh, uh, some irritation and he was not able to swallow food. And that's why uh, silocaine viscous was given. Uh, some For some people, giving silocaine viscous can cause some irritation or some that distaste. To prevent that, we mix it with a 5 ml of gelosyl so that it tastes better. And uh, it will be easily, uh, patient can keep it in the oral cavity. Either he can spit it out or maybe swallow it. Either way can be done. So, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, Sridhar, ma'am, you want to add anything? Uh, no, I would like to hear from participants what do they think and how would they manage? Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that they do manage differently or, or some points like that? Or do they do? Can they? Is it okay with uh, managing with whatever you have explained right now, and uh, any any justifications that they would like to add? Uh, 
would, would be interesting sure. to hear from the participants. Can I, can I, Vidya? If it's a, we're looking at a temporary uh, issue, how about stopping the enteral feeds, switching over to parenteral feeds for some time till the this uh, symptoms settle down and then coming back to giving a break or something? Enteral feed uh, to parenteral feeds. Uh, yes, sir, that, that can definitely be tried. Uh, he was mostly on IV fluids. Uh, this patient uh, because uh, he was not able to take anything orally and once we have started him on uh, all these medicines and along with that we have also given him uh, haloperidol for a few days with that his uh, vomiting has come down. Enteral feeds even uh, some hot centers they use the total parental nutrition in such cases or may maybe some uh, you know uh, IV fluids in such cases, we can try that. And especially if you're suspecting uh, intestinal obstruction or a subacute intestinal obstruction, maybe uh, that will be a better option if required. You have to feel the carcinoma stomach like the case what you were discussing, madam. Like uh, post pyloric feeding, like doing a feeding jejunostomy or something, which can, where the nutritional state can be uh, continued. Uh, taken care of and also uh, this uh, risk of vomiting or uh, can be avoided? Uh, yes, sir. we'll be covering all those things in our next session. Okay, uh, but okay. still, uh, uh, for the spec tube feeding or rice tube feeding can be tried if it is required. The problem, if the patient is continuously vomiting and you're trying to put a rice tube, it can in turn sometimes trigger vomiting. Even if the patient is in rice tube, there is chances that he can have vomiting. So these things should be taken care of and especially prevent uh, aspiration pneumonia because of that. Uh, no, what I'm trying to tell is not the peg feeding because peg feeding is again you're feeding into the stomach, pre-pyloric. So what I'm suggesting was post-pyloric, like you're putting a gastrojejunal tube so that the risk of registration and aspiration is reduced or doing a jejunostomy, feeding jejunostomy or something, so that where the nutritional quality can be maintained and also this risk of gastric stasis and uh, uh, recurrent vomiting can be avoided. Yes, sir, that's true, that's true. But the problem is in such situation, uh, the person to undergo through the surgical procedure is another painful thing. Uh, so in such situations, we need to have a detailed conversation with the patient as well as the family and then come to a point whether that's required or not. Uh, Sri Deva, ma'am, you want to add anything on that? Uh, whatever you said, uh, I will just add one more point, sir. I think it depends on mostly on um, uh, the illness trajectory, uh, where exactly on the illness trajectory the patient is right now on, whether it is... Uh, uh, it mm -hmm. is uh, during towards the end of, uh, I mean, it, if it is like a few days, two weeks, then probably uh, it won't be, as uh, Sangi, Dr. Sangeeta was mentioning, we may not be able to, even if it is a palliative intervention to put in, uh, to to meet the nutritional requirements, sometimes it may not be even possible con considering the general condition. And uh, and as she was mentioning, um, the the prognosis also matters having the communication with the family like it's about what we are going to achieve i understand feeding is important but whether he or she is in a position to get benefit from such feed is some uh, other discussion that we need to have with the family uh, so yeah, it's it's about prognostication you, also uh, uh, the, this thing is like see anybody who has uh, expected even if it is expected uh, life expectancy, uh, this thing survival is for about uh, three months, six months also. So that the quality of life is much better instead of uh, that's what uh, my this thing. Yes, yes. If, yeah, if you are expecting six months, few months, six months uh, or more, yeah. or uh, suppose if you, even in early in the stay when you expect these are the things he can develop. So that early in the stage of the illness itself, if this can be offered, so that the quality of life can be much better. That's what. Uh, Yes, yes, definitely. If the prognosis is better and uh, uh, if he is able to undergo palliative uh, feeding procedures, then definitely yes. So that's what I wanted to convey. Like it depends on 
the patient's current situation and survival and uh, discussion with the family definitely thank you thank you so much sir thank you thank yeah. you madam uh, there is another uh, two charts like granisetron is anti emetic that worked well for uh, some of our patients in case of vomiting. Uh, yes, Dr. Parvati, I think it depends on uh, the reason for vomiting, as Dr. Sangeeta was mentioning, which receptor was involved. If the vomiting was caused by some irritant or something which crossed the blood brain barrier or CTZ, definitely yes, then any uh, uh, serotonin uh, inhibitors like on dancetron or granisetron works really well, especially if it is drug induced due to some. Any, any kind of, not just cancer chemotherapy, but any kind of um, chemotherapeutic agents, then um, ondansetron or granisetron works really well in controlling that vomiting. Uh, so there is another comment, ultraset. Yes, ultraset is, uh, or tramadol is a very nauseating drug. Uh, but sometimes when you measure the pain, if it is like moderate pain, then probably we may have to choose a step two uh, analgesics. I think uh, they have added a metoclopramide also into that regimen, I guess. Uh, so that might have taken care of, but that's a very valid point. Tramadol is a very, very nauseating drug than many other opioids, like including morphine. Tramadol is a very nauseating drug. But yeah, here, I think the patient had a mild to moderate pain. So probably uh, um, a mild dose of tramadol, that will be the justification. And uh, they, they have given metoclopramide also uh, for for preventing that vomiting. Yeah, the last point of discussion is support for the bereaved family after the patient's passing. Uh, definitely, uh, the, this thing has often very recently in our inpatient unit, and uh, it's only been a few days. So definitely, bereavement support is something which we do on a regular basis. And the family needs handholding in uh, in their further journey in life. So we'll be doing that. And uh, the person, I said you, the patient was a very socially active person. And during the later part of the uh, his life, he was like withdrawing from everything. Uh, especially that he started losing his weight and he started looking very uh, ill-looking face and all that. The patient slowly stopped talking to his friends. Even he doesn't want to come out of his house. He was in a room, totally shattered. So uh, the family was also, the other family members, the wife and the son was also totally in a very upsetting situation. And uh, after coming here, we tried to address that uh, problems. We had a good uh, psychologist support uh, to him, to whom uh, they were under the con constant counseling sessions and all that. And following which we had him going out in our hospital veranda where he was there and in trying to interact with the uh, other uh, inpatient pa uh, families also. So that was a good, small progress which he had, but unfortunately he passed away and uh, definitely bereavement support will be taking care of the, uh, uh, keeping in touch with the wife and uh, his son. Uh, definitely, you will come across so many patients having nausea and vomiting uh, and constipation. And uh, I hope this was of some help uh, in uh, your management with uh, similar patients in future. And definitely, you will have so many doubts when you are uh, trying to treat them. So uh, you can ask any doubts or uh, keep in contact with us. And uh, either to mail or anything, you have the WhatsApp group and all. So you can ask your doubts in that as well. So there is a second part for this, uh, where we will be dealing with the intestinal obstruction. And uh, that will be on Monday. So yeah, over to you, Ma'am Sridhar. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for the interaction and uh, just one more comment dr shivkumar has mentioned about hyponatremia yes very valid it is important to understand look for correctables if there is anything correctable in terms of electrolyte imbalance or any metabolic disturbances that is also that has to also to be looked into very carefully uh, patient on chemotherapy doesn't essentially always means that he or she is vomiting because of the chemotherapeutic agents looking into other parameters is also very very important thank you so much sir for your 
uh, valuable comment. Thank you so much all the participants, Dr. Sangeeta, uh, for uh, taking them through the GI symptoms uh, information. Thank you so much all the participants for your interaction. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ajmal, for sharing your experience with the patient and uh, having a discussion with that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sankita. It was, as usual, uh, always it is a pleasure having sessions with you and we do uh, look forward to more sessions in future as well. Thank you everyone for joining in and we will be continuing as Dr. Sankita said with the bowel obstruction, focus on bowel obstruction on coming Monday. With that promise, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Sri Devi Warrior and Dr. Sankita Suresh signing off from the Tipsy Goham. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone take care. Bye-bye.